All right, so for those that just joined us live stream, welcome to Innovation, um, Innovation Boot Camp, although you'll get more of the lecturing aspect of the boot camp, but welcome. So first we're gonna talk about why innovation's so difficult, right? And innovation's difficult because one, it's our conditioning. I want you to think back to elementary school, right? When you were in math class and you were taught that five plus five equals 10. You were never taught what two numbers make 10. I want you to think of what that does to your conditioning, what that does to your brain, okay? When you're taught that there is one definite answer, there's only one right answer, and there you can't go right or left, right? What, is that, that, what does that do to that child, right? It makes them grow up thinking there's one definite answer, right? Um, instead of asking, what two numbers make 10? A lot of answers, really creative ones. Right, ones that require you to dig a little deeper, okay? So it starts so early, so early, that we don't quite understand, okay, how do we actually work with limitless answers? How do we get limitless answers? Because we've been taught that doesn't exist, okay? So for those of you that say, oh yeah, I'm not creative, you're absolutely right, but it's not your fault, okay? That's the good thing, it's not your fault. And for those of you that think you are really, really creative, it's because you've been able to break out of it early. Something happened early where you were able to really push yourself. Um, there was a wonderful recent study done on traumatized children, and it found that traumatized children were really creative because they learned to break free really early. They learned to get out of their own heads. They learned to create their own worlds really early. So something had to trigger that creativity in you. So not only is your conditioning not allowing you to be creative. It's also your biology, okay? It's your evolution. As we were evolving to survive, it meant that we had to be in group norms. We had to follow. It meant that if we were trying to something new, it was risky, risk was brought up, and that could, have, that could mean that we were gonna be eaten by a predator, or we were gonna put our, ourselves in harm's way. So Charles Duhigg does a lot of research on this where he says, we are so hardwired not to be creative, we are so hardwired not to break habits that literally we freeze. We just freeze. And if we don't freeze, we flee, right? We're not wired to deal with uncertainty. We're not wired to deal with creative new ideas and that makes us really nervous. Does this make sense? Just clicking, okay? So now everything is literally layered for you not to be creative. Your conditioning, your biology, and one more really important thing, your culture, right? And the culture in which you were raised, right? I grew up in rural Syria, 25 miles north of Damascus. You were not allowed to be creative in rural Syria, okay? It was just not something that was encouraged. It was really, group and community norms. You belong to a community, you belong to a group, you had one standard way of doing things. And when I came to the West, I saw that that wasn't really any different here, right? If we step a little bit outside of the status quo, like I wanna step out of my live stream box right now, if we step a little bit, then we get looks, right? Then we get, well, maybe the nonprofit sector isn't ready for this. The board isn't really ready for this. Oh, how are, how are we gonna educate our funders on this, right? We start thinking of all the possible things that could go wrong, right? Because again, our system is freezing, going, bad idea, now how do I react? I react by finding ways to kill this idea, okay? So not only conditioning, not only biology, but also your own culture. Do you see why you're not creative, okay? Do you see why it's so difficult to get unstuck? Because you're not wired to be unstuck, okay? So for, and that carries over to our processes today at work, right? Our processes are very linear. Our processes are very A to Z. We have a very clear process at work. We love our logic models, <laughs> right? Um, we don't know how to step outside of our logic models, right? We love a very clear process. 
There is a point in evolution, though, where we did have to be creative. And that was in a moment of dire crisis. That was in a moment where it meant our lives were being threatened. And we adapted. We did something to adapt. That's when we were creative. Do we see that today? Absolutely. The best innovations in this country come out of recessions for a reason, right? It is a moment of dire need. It is a moment where everyone around us is suffering and we feel the need to do something, okay? And that also carries to our professional life, right? In an emergency when everything is burning, we're ready to be creative. We're ready to put out the fire in creative ways, right? But in our day-to-day, -day, somehow creativity isn't there. Somehow it has left us because we really enjoy the habit in the day-to-day. -day. We're creatures of habit, literally, right? And if you're interested in this, Charles Duhigg does a wonderful book called The Power of Habit, which my colleagues will tell you I talk about consistently. Um, it's a great book that just talks about how you get stuck in your habit and how to break those, okay? What we need to do is we just need to look at the other side. The other side is messy. It's uncomfortable. I tell my students that innovation is a safe space, right? And I love this. My boss at TSNE says this all the time, but innovation is not a comfortable space. Okay? It, it forces us into an uncomfort, and we have to be brave about it. We have to be really brave about it. Okay? Because when everything is literally stacked up against us, stacked up against us not being creative, it takes a lot of guts, for lack of a better word, right? It takes a lot of guts for us to actually step out and say we are going to be creative. That takes some bravery, okay? So, you know, I heard the word messy. Is it messy? Absolutely, it's messy, right? Is it complicated? Absolutely. Is it gonna make you comfortable and your team comfortable? Absolutely, I'm not sugarcoating you, right? And you're probably wanting run, to run out this door right now, right? Um, but throughout this boot camp, you're gonna be a little bit uncomfortable with these tools, and that's okay. Recognize that uncomfort. I'm uncomfortable because I'm growing. I'm uncomfortable because this is new. I'm uncomfortable because I'm forced not to look for perfection. I'm gonna recognize that and move on. Okay, and that's okay. Okay, and you'll be working in groups, so tell your team, say, this makes me uncomfortable a bit. It's uneasy for me. But we're gonna, we're gonna try to work it through. Okay, and I promise you, the more you do design thinking activities, the more your comfort level will increase. So today, see that the side of the slide that's all you know, linear and charts? Forget about that. Throw it out the window. Take it out of your memory, okay? Put in color, right? RuPaul Charles always says, I love to play with every color in the crayon box, right? And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna play with every color in the crayon box. So design thinking, I love this little cartoon, because there are two types of people that work in design thinking. There are people on one end that are like, design thinking, this is the process, this is the way, you have to do it, and you must do it correctly and you must do it A to Z. And you're like, doesn't that defeat the purpose of design thinking, <laughs> right? Um, and then there are other people on the other side that say, no, design thinking is a free for all. You just take and choose, throw out what you want, it's like a salad bar, a salad bar of tools, right? I am somewhere in the middle. I believe you have to have a good foundation in design thinking. You have to have practice in design thinking. And then once you have a good solid understanding, then you start taking and tailoring and saying this is what's gonna work for my strategic planning process. This is what's gonna work for this program design session I'm about to have. This is what's gonna work for this new program idea I'm about to develop, okay? But don't do that right away. Don't start tailoring right away. Because what happens is most likely you won't be successful and you'll blame the process. And then you'll become anti-design thinking. But really you weren't even really using design thinking. Okay, so be mindful of that. So everyone and their mama has a design thinking process. If you just put design thinking process onto Google, you'll get tons. 
IDEO, Interaction Design Foundation, all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful processes. I'm not putting down any of these processes, um, especially because I'm, I'm on a live stream, so I'm definitely not putting down any of these processes. Uh, and you know, Columbia Business School, Design for Growth is another process, all really good, strong processes. What I'm learning is they're not all set up to serve the nonprofit sector, okay? They weren't designed for us. They weren't designed with dealing with funders, <laughs> right? They weren't designed with um, trying to secure funding, right? Trying to get major donors, trying to get the right people on our board. They weren't secured for that. So today I've come up with my own process that we've been using at TSNE Mission Works that we will use throughout this boot camp, okay? And it's in your, the process is step by step in your playbook. And we will do it throughout the boot camp. Um, I, I have to put a disclaimer that I'm not saying this is the process you should go out and do and marry and, you know, and sell to your organization. But this is a process where I think it has a lot of tools that will be relevant to your day to day. Okay, with my experience in the nonprofit sector and working in design thinking in the nonprofit sector. First, let me give you my definition of design thinking. This is not accepted by anyone, <laughs> okay? Putting a disclaimer on there. What I think design thinking means for you and I in this sector is the approach in which the creator and end user work together to yield insights and patterns that inform the navigation of uncertainty. That's what I think design thinking means to us. It is working with our end user, our program participants, our students in our schools, our patients, whatever, our guests, whatever you have, um, whatever, whoever our end user is. It is working with them, right? It is a human-centered process. It is working with them, co-creating with them to get insights, to get patterns, to get different ideas that can yield that, un that path of uncertainty, that path of unknown that we are often faced, okay? So what does the process look like? Um, this slide's gonna overwhelm you. I'm gonna tell you right now, okay? For the live stream folks, it's really gonna overwhelm you. Um, for the folks that are joining us live, we're gonna go through it step by step, okay? So it's gonna seem really scary at first, really overwhelming, and it should, it's different. But once you start playing with it, we're gonna break it down, okay? First, we start with our question, our vision. What are we trying to solve together today? We're not gonna end poverty today, right? But we're gonna try to work on some social issues. We're gonna come up with creative ideas. What are we working on? And this could be a how might we statement, right? How might, how might we? increase local, increase um, access to locally grown food in Lowell, Massachusetts, okay? That is a how might we statement, that is a question, that is a vision we can explore, okay? Then we're gonna move towards this diamond. And the first part of the diamond is think big. Look at all your faces, you're all like, what the heck did I sign up for? <laughs> okay, we're gonna come up with as many ideas as possible to solve our problem. Quantity, not quality. Quantity, not quality. One more time. Quantity, not quality. Good, okay, good. Um, it's so critical that we have as many creative ideas as possible. Innovation happens in two ways. When we're making connections, and when we're building on top of other ideas, okay? And we can't do that with a limited pool of ideas. We need a large pool of ideas to be able to make those connections and to be able to build ideas on top of each other, okay? Then each of you today will get a persona, a human you're designing for, right? This is a human-centered design process. A human, we will, I will give you there are a little information about them, some data, because I know y'all love your data, so there'll be some data on there. Um, who are they, right? And then you're gonna look at your ideas, 
look at this wonderful person you are designing for and say, okay, now what? So we got 30, 40, I would hope you have more than 30 and 40 ideas. Let's say you got 30 and 40 ideas. You go, okay, see these five are all really relevant to this person. What do we do with them? Is there a theme here? Do we connect them? Do we build them on top of each other? Is this scary? A little bit. Okay, that's why you got three wonderful facilitators. Okay, because it will be it will be scary. Um, but what you're looking for is to link, to connect, and this is also there's how tos and guides in your book, so you'll have all kinds of resources for you today. Okay. And then we're going to clarify. You're going to pick the one solution you said. You know, this is it. This is the one solution we're going to work with for today. Okay, in an ideal world, you'd probably have three, four, five, six, seven, eight solutions, right? And then maybe find some vetting process to actually vet those out to determine which one. Hopefully, it's with your end user. Hopefully, it's with that human you're serving. They're sitting at the table with you looking at your solutions. Okay, but for the sake of today, we're going to pick three and then vote on one, okay, to move through our boot camp. After we're clear on the what, we have to become clear on the how. Okay, so there's clearly a process that you would do within your team prior to this is the why, right, why you're doing it. But that, that's, in, that's done independently in your organization. That's not fitting for a boot camp. But once you've identified the what, now we're going to learn how to identify the how. And the how, very similar to think big, is what are all the possible ways we could solve this? With who? Who do we need? What resources do we need? Quantity over quality. Okay, this is the part of the diamond where quantity is over quality. Quantity, thank you, okay? And then you're gonna box it up. You got some boxes. So you're gonna say, every, each table has two boxes, one a larger one, one small one. You're going to think of, if this was a tangible product, what would it look like? Who would buy it? Why would they buy it? What would the disclaimers be on that box? Right, I had a great boss in design thinking who made me go into grocery stores and take pictures of packaging and then come back and try to see how we were going to apply those um, things that we saw in packaging to our nonprofit program. Okay, it was a really challenging, abstract, um, project, but it got me thinking about what the packaging were saying. Who, what, how, what are the warnings, right? It got me thinking of all the things I needed to be thinking about, but in a really creative, fun way. And once you have that box, you're going to go to another group, and you're going to test it out with them. You're going to have a list of user testing questions, and you're going to say, you know, what do you think of this idea? Wh and I'm hoping you're going to rip each other's boxes apart, right? So rip them apart. It's okay, that's okay, feedback's good. Feedback's what moves our process. And we're gonna keep doing that, right? You're gonna get some feedback and keep moving your box forward until you feel like this is the final product, right? In an ideal world, so our boot camp will end here once you have a box, but in an ideal world, you would release that program, that product, that tech tool, whatever you're working on into the world. Um, and then you would repeat the process. Because the whole point of us being here today is to create something quickly with limited resources, and that means it's not going to be perfect, right? That means that once we've released it, we go back, we experiment, we rethink, we redesign, and then we relaunch. And guess what, we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, okay? At a project I'm working on for TSM Mission Works, we're in the second part of that loop, right? We keep redoing it, redoing it till we feel like we have perfected it. We have a product ready. Okay? I told you it was going to overwhelm you. That's okay. Okay? Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable. That's okay. Right? We're going to dive deeper into each of these steps. You'll have a lot of time. You'll have 20, 30 minutes on each step to really explore get your hands dirty and figure out how do we actually make this come to life. 
but you'll, have, you'll get that opportunity. Okay, sound good? Are we good? Can I hear some excitement? Okay, so is this where I say goodbye to my live stream folks? All right, live stream folks, goodbye I guess.